Welcome to the presentation of a lecture from Gnostic Radio, a free public service from the Gnostic tradition of Samael Aoun Veor. Gnosis is the root wisdom of all the world's great religions. Gnosis is a universal teaching of practical science, whose goal is absolute liberation from suffering and the complete development of the human being. This lecture is one of hundreds available as free downloads, podcasts, or transcriptions. Our lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures to find teachings that suit you. Each Saturday, Gnostic Radio broadcasts live and includes a free online classroom allowing listeners to see images, read related scriptures, and ask questions of the speaker. To learn how to participate, visit GnosticRadio.org. Gnostic Radio is a service of Glorian Publishing, a non-profit organization. The lectures and radio broadcast have been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. To make a donation, visit GnosticRadio.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Welcome to today's lecture on healthy spirituality. It's part two, caring for your temple. It's the second half of our proteins lecture. If you happen to miss um, the first lecture, you can go to GnosticRadio.org and uh, download it over there. Okay, Mike, a little fun. So on our first half of our proteins lecture, we actually went over um, eggs, meat, factory farming practices um, that are common these days, fish, and which fish are safe to eat and not so safe to eat depending on your region, and what we could do to help um, improve the food system. So like I said, if you missed it, please go uh, to Gnostic Radio, download this lecture. It's accompanied by a PowerPoint as well as this one. So if you're listening live, uh, the the PowerPoint is available to you um, that says download your the resources for this lecture. If you're listening, listening to this lecture um, that's been recorded, just look for the link and it'll bring you to this PowerPoint. I'll be talking about certain slides and they're numbered, so just follow along as uh, we go. Okay, so I wanted to give you a update actually on Frankenfish. Do you remember last lecture we spoke about um, what was happening in uh, the GMO side of things. They're trying to make this new fish. It's a salmon, and they're crossing two types of fish, um, the Chinook salmon and this other eel-like fish. And they're taking certain genes from these two fish, and they're trying to make this super salmon. <laughs> so if you take a look at this photo on uh, slide three, the small salmon is the normal size salmon. And the bigger salmon is the one that they are genetically modifying. So um, it grows twice as fast. You know, it's ready to eat quicker. So they're thinking that, well, this is going to be better for everybody because we'll have more salmon, you know, more quickly. The problem is that we don't know what genetically modified foods will do to us. So um, there was a hearing, actually. There have been two hearings so far since the last lecture I gave about a month ago. The Food and Drug Administration says they could not reach a conclusion on whether to permit the sale of genetically altered salmon. So um, on September 20th, there was a 11-member uh, advisory panel told Aqua Bounty, that's the name of the company who's trying to produce the salmon, uh, that there is not yet sufficient sufficient data to determine whether genetic modification is safe for the fish or consumers. So we still don't know whether they're going to allow this or not. Uh, like I said at the last lecture, we know that if they do allow this, this will just be the first step because afterwards we'll follow, you know, cows, pigs, chickens, sheep, goats. So 
I'll keep you abreast of the situation, but as of right now, they're saying we don't know if it's safe or not. So beware of the Frankenfish. Uh, but I did, you know, I was, I was re- when I was researching uh, and up, I was looking for updates on the Frankenfish story. I call it Frankenfish. It's really the genetically modified salmon. But as I was looking, I actually did feel a little bit of hope because I found a really interesting article on October 14th, which made me feel a little bit assured that I'm not the only one who's thinking about these things and thinking it's wrong, that actually there are people in government who are questioning this. And I just want to read you um, excerpts of this article that I found. It's um, called Hawkins Calls for a Ban on Genetically Modified Organisms in the Food Chain. So uh, Howie Hawkins, he's from the Green Party. He's a Green Party candidate for governor in uh, New York. And he said that he's calling for a ban on the planting of genetically modified crops in New York State. The Greens have previously drafted state legislation to impose a five-year moratorium on the planting of such crops. Okay, this sounds good, right? And we're like, this, this would be a great thing, give scientists more time to study how genetically modified crops are affecting us. And it says, I love this quote, Americans have become guinea pigs for the biotechnology industry due to the negligence of federal and state policies to protect consumers. Genetic engineering represents nothing less than a going out of business sale on genetic diversity. GMOs should not be released into the environment since there is no adequate scientific understanding of their impact on the environment and on human health. He goes on to say that it's a dangerous global experiment by giant transnational biotechnology companies who control large segments of the world's food supply, including food patents, seed companies, and other aspects of the food chain. The unpredictable nature of climate change increases the risk. Um, He talks about how this is all for short-term commercial gain, and it's at the risk of our health and the safety of the whole population. So... As I read this article, I said, well, at least there are some government officials who are actually talking about this. Because you will not hear many Democrats or Republicans talking about this. So at least somebody out there is addressing this. And it gave me some hope that there will be more said in the future as we realize more and more how dangerous it is trying to play God. Because that's what it is, basically. And uh, something encouraging was that at least 30 countries have banned or proposed to ban GMOs, including many European countries. Um, In the U.S., Gerber and Heinz Baby Foods, Frito-Lay, IAMS Pet Foods, Trader Joe's, and even McDonald's and Burger King are now refusing GMO corn, potatoes, and other ingredients. So it looks like that's a step. I'm not saying go out and eat these foods, but it's a step in the right direction that at least people are... coming aware that there's something wrong. If we keep demanding not to be fed this food, somebody's going to start listening. So um, that's why we have to become aware of what's happening around us. You know, as I'm preparing for these lectures, there are things that really um, affect me as well as I'm learning because I realize that the crude reality of what's happening is at the price of our health and the health of the animals that are part of this industry. And so, as we talk about certain aspects of today's lecture, specifically the dairy production in this country, there's going to be some parts that are going to be hard to listen to. But in order for us to make the best choices for ourselves, we need to know what's going on. You know, and that's why... um, We're here anyway. We're here to learn, right? We're here to learn about ourselves, to learn about spiritual, uh, our spiritual lives, and to learn about life, what's going on around us. And ignorance is not bliss. Okay, so that's what I'm going to hope to show you today uh, through today's lecture. Uh, The proteins I'm going to cover in this lecture are dairy, the products available from bees. We'll talk about beans and grains and whether or not vegetarianism is necessary for walking on the spiritual path, and we'll also talk about the common cosmic trogoato egocratic law. Okay, say that ten times fast. Mm-hmm. All right. So we're going to start with um, dairy, <clears throat> and in regards to dairy, 
You know, many people have negative reactions to cow's milk, and that's mostly what we've all been raised on, right? Cow's milk. If you go to the store, cow's milk is the thing that you see the most of. Um, but many people can't tolerate cow's milk. They're lactose intolerant. So, uh, you know, I encourage you to try other types of milk too. Buttermilk, other products, yogurt, butter, ghee, other species like goat and sheep. As well as trying to, buy, uh, trying to buy organic or pasture fed dairy to avoid bovine growth hormone. And we're going to talk about what that is in a minute. Um, also, try to find raw milk in your area because that's the less processed and has the most nutrition, which we'll also talk about. <clears throat> so the first thing is uh, goat milk, goat's milk. It's another alternative to cow's milk. People who can't tolerate cow's milk have a really good um, tolerance for goat's milk. And it's because of the protein structure in goat's milk is more similar to that, um, to human milk than cow's milk is. So when we drink goat, goat's milk, it's more natural for our body. Okay. Um, because of the fact that they have smaller curds and it's easier to, to digest for our stomach than cow's milk is. So if you have never tried goat's milk, try it. You know, the worst thing that can happen is, well, I don't like it, but just try it. Uh, another product you can get with uh, goat is goat butter, which if you know me, you know I love goat butter. For breakfast this morning, I had toast with goat butter. And uh, personally, I like it. The flavor is just more rich. It tastes more like butter to me or what I think butter should taste like. <laughs> so give it a try. I, I really have um, given up cow's butter, except for ghee, which we'll talk about. Um, but goat's butter and goat's milk is a very nice alternative. So give it a try if you haven't, okay? Especially if you're lactose intolerant and have given up on cow's milk. So another product that we can make um, out of dairy is ghee. Has anyone ever heard of ghee? Okay. If you like Indian food, you probably know ghee. If you've cooked Indian food, it's a staple. And um, it's otherwise known as clarified butter. So it's well known to gourmet cooks and, um, you know, to those who know Indian recipes. It's made out of, uh, ghee is made when the milk solids are separated from the liquid and it leaves you with a clear amber colored substance. Uh, similar to what's in the photo there. And it's been used for like 2,000 years in Ayurvedic medicine, uh, which is the ancient healing system in India, Ayurvedic medicine. So ghee, the nice thing about ghee is it's lactose-free and can be used as a healthy substitute for butter or cooking oils. It won't turn rancid at room temperature, so you could literally just leave it out on your counter and you don't need to refrigerate it. And it's been known uh, to have many health benefits. So if you look at uh, slide eight, you'll see that it's been um, known to provide healthier skin, increased mental clarity, it's good for your digestion. Um, it also has, helps your body to assimilate nutrients from the foods you eat. So in Ayurvedic medicine, they really feel that, um, you know, this is, this is your engine, your stomach is your engine. So if you put good things into your engine, obviously the rest of you is going to work well. Ghee is known to stimulate your engine, okay, to help you with your digestion. So for example, um, I, make, I make the clarified butter. It's really easy to make. Uh, on slide nine, I have instructions on how you can make it. Just literally, literally you start with pure organic uh, unsalted butter. And what you do is you just heat it up, uh, you simmer it on a slow, uh, low heat, and then three layers are going to actually form. It's going to be a foamy, watery layer, which is skimmed off. You just skim that part off. Then you're going to have a solid butter layer and a milk solids layer. So when you boil it, it takes about 20 minutes, 20, 20 minutes to 30 minutes. And you just, you'll see like this whole process starts to happen with, happen with the boiling and you'll just skim that off. And what you're left with, if you look on slide nine, is that clear liquid on the left. And then when it cools down, it looks like the photo on the right. And that's what you could just leave on your counter. And I use it for my cooking. Um, you could, like you said, you could use it to butter your bread if you like. It doesn't have that milk fat does, that butter has. So you know when they say, oh, butter's not good for you because it's, give you, it's high in cholesterol and this and that. This gets rid of that and just leaves the, the purity of the butter. And I mean, if you suffer from high cholesterol, I'm not telling you to just eat 
ghee all day. Don't do that either. Uh, moderation is key. But this is a healthier version of butter. Okay, so especially for cooking, I love it. It gives it a really different flavor as well. It's, um, it's, a little, it's different than butter, but uh, it's, it's richer. It's sort of like a richer flavor because it's all that water is out and all of that, so it just really condenses it to a purer form. So if you haven't tried it, I encourage you to try it, and that's how simple it is to make. You could buy it at the stores, but the versions I've seen at the stores don't use organic butter, so I like to start with the organic unsalted butter. So just take a look. You could find it nowadays in, in most stores. So um, the next thing we're going to talk about is actually, all right, so what are some of the problems that with milk? with the dairy industry? Well, pasteurization, homogenization, genetically engineered or recombat recombatant bovine growth hormone, hormone, otherwise known as RBGH, steroids, hormones, antibiotics, and factory farming. These are the issues that we are faced with now when we choose our milk, our milk products, and what's happening in the dairy industry. Um, you know, cow's milk has always been promoted as the perfect food for children high in protein, calcium, and healthy calories. But on the other hand, what's happening with milk these days, um, there are many problems. And because of how the milk is being processed, and I'm talking about conventional milk. I'm not talking about organic or raw right now. I'm talking about conventional milk. It's been shown to produce allergies, anemia, autism, diabetes, and even cancer due to the hormones that they're adding to um, the cows. So milk, most milk nowadays is extracted from cows that are kept producing milk with the help of hormones. That's what the, RGB, the RBGH is. Long after the, the need, they need it for their calves. So the, cow, the cows are actually fed commercially created feeds that include hay, grain, cardboard, and wood shavings. Yeah, they are generally plied with antibiotics and they are often sick and below par. Okay, so despite opposition from scientists, farmers, and consumers, the United States currently allows dairy cows to be injected with recombatant bovine growth hormone, RBGH, um, also known as recombatant bovine somatotropin, RBST. That's why a lot of times you'll see on, the, on some of the milk it says no RBGH. That's what that means, that, that there's no added um, growth hormone to that milk. It was developed and manufactured by the Monsanto Corporation. If you're not familiar with Monsanto, you will be, I will be doing another lecture on that. And um, this genetically engineered hormone forces cows to artificially increase milk production by 10 to 15%. So there's obviously controversy surrounding this because they don't know how healthy this is for the cows or for people, but they just keep doing it. So that's why we're the guinea pigs. So um, other problems that we have with the milk processing, you know, nowadays most of our milk is homogenized and pasteurized. And the reason that that is, is because when American cities were being developed and expanding, ma many of the dairies were located in uh, the city centers. And overcrowding, unkept barns, usually they held about 4,000 cows in these centers barns. And so you could imagine there was a lot of waste. Um, uh, the cows were actually fed waste residue from grains used in nearby liquor distilleries and breweries. So the cows were actually fed that which came from those breweries and distiller distilleries. So you could imagine the health of the cows was not very good. And um, it, the milk lacked refrigeration, there was poor human sanitation, there were vermin, there were insect infestations, and all of those re reasons made milk very risky to drink in those days. So you can imagine, not many people were eager to drink milk because you'd probably get sick off of it. And so that's where, by the mid-1800s, um, reformers pushed for country milk to come into the city. But the country milk was no better because the sanitation, the practices that they were using there. So what they did was towards the end of the 19th century, pasteurization came along. And they said, oh, well, if we heat up the milk, we kill off all the bad stuff, right? We kill off all the, the germs and everything that's in there. And that's where pasteurization started. And um, what pasteurization does is it actually kills the bacteria 
that is essential for di its digestion. So the bacteria that's in the milk is there so that we could digest it, but we're killing it off, and that's why so many people are lactose intolerant, because that is killed off through the heating process. It also destroys many proteins, enzymes, immune factors, hormones, vitamins, and minerals that made milk good in the first place. It converts lactose to an indigestible form, and it interferes with calcium absorption. So it actually destroys up to 50% of the calcium that was present in the milk, as well as vitamins A, C, and B complex. So just by heating it, before, yes, you know, the, the milk may have been risky to drink because of all those factors, but now you're heating the milk and you're getting rid of all the factors that made milk good to drink in the first place. So that's what pasteurization is doing right now. And what's interesting about this, as I was reading about pasteurization, it says, um, you know, the bacteria found naturally in milk are killed. But, so these cells, you know, burst, right, from the heat. But all those particles of those cells of the bacteria just remain floating in the milk. So we're just drinking all these, like, dead bacteria cells with the milk. I don't know about you, but that was just like, oh, <laughs> that just did not make me feel like I want to have a big glass of regular milk. And also, because those cells are in there still, those bursted cells, that's what creates um, histamine or allergic reactions for many people. So many people who drink milk and have reactions, it's because, because those dead cells are still in the milk. So... Um, Homogenization also, homogenization, um, they homogenize milk because what happens, if you leave raw milk on the counter, what happens to it? It separates, right? So you'll have like a level of skim milk and a level of cream. All the fat floats up to the top, creating that cream layer. Well, people are like, well, you know, we can't have milk like that because all we have is cream and skim milk. So what they came up with is homogenization. So they actually, after pasteurizing, they push the milk through this, like, um, through these little tubes, and it forces the milk to mix together so that you don't have those two layers. And so that's what happens during homogenization. But because of that process, homogenization, um, homogenized fat becomes inaccessible. We can't absorb that fat, which is good in the milk. It becomes inaccessible because it's just all mixed up together. So that's what, ha that's what we're drinking, the common milk, and not only con conventional milk, but most um, organic milk is homogenized and pasteurized as well. So this is the common practice today. Even though, you know, we probably don't have to do all of it, we, we still are doing it. Okay, dairy cows. Now the reality of what's happening on our, um, to the dairy cows may be a bit disturbing, but like I said, we need to know what's happening. So traditional small dairies located primarily, primarily in the Northeast and Midwest are going out of business. So, you know, all these small family farms, they're going out of business because all of these big factory farms, they're, they're creating massive amounts of milk and they're being replaced. These um, small family farms are being replaced by, they're called dry lot dairies, which are typically located in the southern, uh, southwest U.S., so regardless of where they live, however, all dairy cows must give birth in order to begin producing milk, right? So today, dairy cows are actually forced to have a calf every year. Like human beings, cows have a nine-month gestation period, and so imagine having a baby every year. That's going to put a lot of strain on your body, as it does put a lot of strain on the poor cows' bodies. And um, it's very obviously very physically demanding for them. So the cows are artificially re-impregnated while they are still lactating from their previous birth, birthing. So their bodies are still producing month during their uh, ugh, their bodies are still producing milk during seven months of their nine-month pregnancy. You know, when a woman gets pregnant, she should not normally be producing milk, right? Your body's preparing to give birth. An animal's preparing to give birth. All the hormones that are that are in the body are preparing for that lactation process. But what's happening now is the cows, they're pregnant and they're still, they have all these hormones and they're lactating. So that means all of the milk that we're drinking, we're actually drinking the hormones that that cow is producing as well because they're never given a break. A normal cow should just be producing hormones for the baby, right? 
but no, she's still producing milk. So um, with genetic manipulation and intensive production technologies, the modern cow produces 100 pounds of milk a day. Okay, that's 10 times more than they should be. As a result, the cow's bodies are under constant stress and they are at risk for numerous health problems. So because that they're being forced to give off so much milk, guess what happens? They have to be given antibiotics and all these treatments because they're sick. So half the country's cows, half the dairy cows, are actually suffering from something called mastitis or a bacterial infection of the udders because they're just being, if you look in this picture on page 12, that's a dairy cow and it's just got, you see the, the part there with the udders? Here are the udders. And she's just got um, these tubes, these metal tubes stuck onto her udders. And they're just pumping all day. Pumping. So um, what happens because these cows are, are, have these infections, they're given, um, they're given antibiotics to fight them. And also, besides um, mastitis, they have other diseases such as bovine leukemia, bovine immune deficiency. There's many diseases that they're suffering from because of these practices. And what happens is um, there are so many cows that are sick on these dairy farms. And, you know, if a cow eats a normal grass diet, they can produce milk at the normal rate, and they, the milk is full of energy. But the way that this milk is being produced nowadays, it doesn't have good energy because it, it's lacking the amount of vitamins. The cow is just being forced to give and give and give. So obviously the hormonal levels, the energy level of the milk is very different. And um, what happens is because they're being fed these grain diets, the, this rich diet is causing a whole bunch of other disorders, especially with their kidneys, because it's just putting so much stress on their bodies. Um, they're either lame or they're having kidney disorders as well. So there's also something called milk fever, and this is, called by cal this is caused by calcium deficiency. It occurs when the milk secretion depletes calcium faster than it can be replenished in the blood. So these poor cows, they don't even have the calcium enough in their bodies. So imagine if they don't have the calcium enough, what does the milk have? Right? That's why milk is being fortified these days with these extra vitamins because it's just becoming more and more empty because of the forced production. So, um, you know, in a healthy environment, cows would live about 25 years or more. The typical dairy cow is, um, they're slaughtered and made into ground beef just three or four years, after three or four years. They're, they're forced to produce for three or four years and then they're sent to the slaughterhouse. So obviously the, the abuse that has been wreaked upon their bodies, you know, makes it so that um, how much nutrition could they have, right? The conventional meat we're buying could be from dairy cows who've you know, been sucked dry for the last three or four years of their life. And that's the reality of conventional, conventionally raised uh, farmed, uh, these farmed, the factory farmed foods. So we have to just keep that in mind as we remember last lecture we were talking about making choices during shopping. That's what we have to keep in mind is that by choosing better foods, we're going to be healthier and also we're not going to be saying yes to this kind of treatment of animals. Same with milk. If you're going to go out and buy milk, at least buy organic milk or pasture-fed milk, right? Because conventionally raised animals are being treated in this way. So um, another thing that's, that's being done very commonly are when calves are born to these dairy cows, they're separated immediately after birth. If it's a female calf, she'll go on to become a, a dairy-producing cow. If it's a male calf, they'll be raised for veal. And uh, they never see their mother. They're just immediately, as soon as they're given birth, they're, you know, I was watching this video, and as soon as the, cow, the calf came out, you know, the mother went to go and clean it and to be with it. They just went and took it away. They stick them in a cardboard box, usually, or a plastic, you know, container, and they, um, the poor uh, calf, can hardly, they can't even turn around because they're usually chained and they're um, given such nutrient, 
the, 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 feed, the feed that they're given, it lacks so much nutrient that they become anemic, and they, they do that in order that the veal may be whiter. And that's the reality of veal production. So, um, you know, it's a really sad reality, and like I said, this is a tough topic to talk about, but we need to talk about it. And in some, um, in addition to the high-priced veal that I just spoke about, some calves are killed at just a few days old to be sold as low-grade bob, they call it, veal for products like frozen TV dinners. So don't eat TV dinners. It's like the worst of the worst. So that's what's going on with dairy cows and the production. And at the end of this lecture, um, I've debated whether or not I'm going to show you the video because as I watched the video, I just started to cry because I can't uh, believe that we have come to this. And if you're an animal lover, I mean, anybody would be affected by this. But as I was reflecting and as I was sniffling and as I was talking to a friend of mine, he says, I said, well, how do we deal with the emotion caused by seeing this? You know, do we just ignore it? Do we just try not to think about it? And, um, well, he said to me, you know, in the Mahayana tradition of Buddhism, they tell you don't ignore it. You have to know what's happening, but then you have to meditate on it. You have to reflect on it. You have to, you know, know about what's going on. And this goes for internally and externally. We have to know what's going on in ourselves and why is this reaction being produced in myself? Why was I sitting there crying after seeing this video? What is, what is that pain inside of me? What is happening? And so after reflecting on it, I decided I will show you the video. Those of you who don't want to watch it don't have to, but I will show you just so you know because part of what I need to do is to teach you. That's the only thing I could do. And so by you knowing, you can teach others. And the more of us that learn about these things, the more of us that will be conscious to what's happening for the sake of profit and greed. And so at the end of this lecture, um, I do have a link and I'll, I'll talk, I'll tell you which link it is for those of you who are listening to this lecture. So <clears throat> this lecture does get more uplifting uh, dairy is the worst. <laughs> it will get better, <laughs> but um, you know we have to know the reality of what's going on. So, so you know, a, a good option for drinking dairy, if you do like to drink milk, I'm not saying don't drink milk. A better option for drinking milk would be organic raw milk. Now, this is um, milk that has not been pasteurized or homogenized. Okay, it's basically the milk that comes out of the cow. And a healthy cow, you know, not a factory farm cow, but a cow that has been pasture fed, that lives like, you know, when we close our minds and we think of a farm, the nice rolling hills and the green grass and the cow grazing, that's where raw milk usually comes from, <laughs> okay? So it's not coming from the factory farm. And um, the nice thing about raw milk is it has everything intact. It has it's the milk that we were intended to drink. So if you grew up on a farm or if you drank raw milk, you were getting all that beneficial bacteria. Bacteria. You were getting all the enzymes necessary for digestion of the milk, the lipase, the protease, and others. You know, they had, it strengthened your immune system. That's where they said children should drink milk. This was the milk we were talking about, not the milk that is now you know, filled with hormones, antibiotics, and different chemicals and poisons. We were talking about this milk. So if you are fortunate enough to live in a state that sells raw milk, and you like to drink milk, I would encourage you to drink raw milk. Not every state, it's not legal in every state. So um, as one of the resources, I have um, realmilk.com will help you to locate real milk, raw milk. And uh, they'll, it's a great website to teach you more about raw milk and what the benefits of it are. Um, you know, our guts, right? 
our guts, because of everything that we're eating, all the genetically modified foods, all the chemicals, all you know, the chemicals in water, air, food these days, our guts are unhealthy. If we have an unhealthy gut, it affects the rest of our body. Raw milk helps to colonize good bacteria in your gut. But if we're so used to eating all this bad stuff and you put raw milk in your system, you may have like a reaction to it, right? Because it's like full of life. So you have to start out slow for most people. So you don't go out and drink a big glass of raw milk, okay? <laughs> start out little by little and see how your body reacts to it. You know, all these recommendations that I give you, I don't want you to just go out and buy it and try it like, ooh, and gusto. Try in, in little steps because your body is going to react differently than somebody else's body. And you've got to find the right combination of food for your body. You know, your body is your temple and it's your laboratory. Every person has a different laboratory. And you have to figure out what that, that um, right combination for you is. So, um, like I said, raw milk in California, I believe it is legal. Um, I know in New York it's not, but in Connecticut it is. So if you can't get it in New York, you can get it in Connecticut. And um, in you know, other parts of the world, same thing. In Europe, I know there are many factory farms, and they're just increasing. Um, so look for raw milk. You know, some countries, that's all they have is raw milk. And that's great. You know, a lot of these people just buy milk from their neighbors, from the farms. If you're one of those lucky ones, then fabulous. You don't have to worry about what us city folk are worrying about, where to find real milk. Okay, so I just want to show you some of the, the benefits and differences of um, raw milk. Thanks to this website called Organic Pastures. Hmm, hello. Technology is playing with me. There we go. Um, this website called Organic Pastures is a great reference because what it does is it does a comparison between conventional certified organic and uh, raw certified milk. And um, everybody here will receive a handout of this. So, But the nice thing about this is it's really showing you, so what are the differences? Conventional milk, you know, everyday milk. And um, I, I'm giving you this because I want you to be able to make your own judgment as to what you want to be putting in your body. So if we look at, for example, conventional milk, the historical um, aspect of it, you know, we could see that Conventional milk, it was designed for economical purposes. You know, mass production, let's sell milk to everybody. We really don't care how healthy the cows are. Um, factory farming practices. Um, you know, historically, factory farming was nothing compared to what it is now. Now we're, we're you know, adding all the hormones, the high grains, the GMOs, no pasture. A cow on a factory farm will never see grass. Okay, that's the reality. And um, yes, they're accountable to the FDA and to the USDA inspectors, but how often do you think those inspectors get out to those farms? Not too often. So, um, you know, they get away with a lot of stuff, and there aren't many laws in place for factory farms. That's the reality of it. Whereas, um, if it's USDA certified organic, the problem with this now is organic has grown astronomically. More and more people are demanding organic milk and organic meat. And so what that has caused is uh, factory farmed, factory organic farms. Okay? So you think, oh, I'm getting organic. It's much better. Investigate where you're getting your organic from. Because some of these organic farms are not much better than factory farms, okay? Yes, they won't. They're not allowed to put, you know, the hormones and all that. But, for example, I was looking at one factory farm. I won't say the name. If you want to know, I'll tell you afterwards. But um, it showed an image of them. You know one of those um, Im satellite images? And it actually showed a lagoon of waste, of you know, manure and, and animal waste, a lagoon. It was black. It was just, you could see it from the satellite image. It was just like a black lagoon. So obviously some organic farms are still not doing the best that they could. Yes, it's better than conventional factory farms, but there are still some issues. Some organic farms are doing a great job. 
but others aren't. So just investigate your, your organic uh, company that you're choosing. Okay? So um, they are accountable to the government as well, uh, the certified organic dairy. And then the raw dairy, if you take a look at historically, you know, they use natural science as the basis for purity and safety. Their product remains whole. It's just the milk that's coming out of the cow. They're not doing all the stuff that, you know, organic or conventional is doing. It's not influenced by factory farming um, practices. They're just really trying to do, you know, um, pasture-raised animals. So uh, their, their animals get more um, time outside. And anyone who can review the lab tests at any time. You could tour the facilities. You can take a look. So, I mean, how many places let you come and see what they're doing? The factory farms won't let you come and see because they don't want anybody to see. Okay? It's actually against the law to show images and video of factory farms. You can get sued if you do it. So, um, Production practices, if you look at uh, slide 15, conventional. So it's being pasteurized, homogenized, hormones are added, antibiotics are added, there's zero pasture time, uh, piles of manure, the animals are literally living in, within their manure. They live in concrete and steel environments. There's a short lifespan for the cows, artificial breeding, they're factory farmed, they're eating GMO. Um, artificial food byproducts and plastics. They're given even plastic to eat. And there's unnatural feed like soy and cotton seed, and there's a heavy use of pesticides. So that's the common practice for conventional dairy. Okay. Now if you look at uh, the middle column with the certified organic, okay, yes, it's still pasteurized, it's still homogenized, there's no hormones or antibiotics added. That's a benefit, that's good. Um, but they may have zero pasture time. It doesn't necessarily mean that they do have pasture time, but as I was investigating, I did see something promising, actually. Um, they did say that there was a new law passed um, February 12, 2010. The Department of Agriculture announced that animals must graze pasture during the grazing season at least 120 days per year. That's organic. So this actually... Um, I think this, this will be eventually changed where hopefully if you know, this all passes and it gets put into effect, organic and um, milk will have to have cows that are pasture at least outside 120 days of the year. Hopefully that gets passed and practiced. But look, they're still in concrete and steel environments, many of them, and uh, they have a longer lifespan, but many end up at the factory farm. So even though these animals were at an organic farm, eventually they get retired and probably sent to a factory farm. And um, there are no GMOs, and the funny thing is they're fed anything that's organic. So if you have a donut that's organic, they could get fed that, as long as it's organic. And um, they, don't use, they only use organic pesticides. Okay? And then if you look at the raw certified, you know, it's never pasteurized, never homogenized. Just take a look. I mean, all the things that we worry about are really not in that raw milk. The, sh the lifespan, they live four times longer or more than the other cows. And um, they're bred naturally, you know, no GMOs, no pesticides. So it's just a better alternative as well during production practices. And as far as food safety goes, um, the conventional dairy... Pathogens is just another word for germs. So if you look at conventional, there are germs present in raw milk 31% of, I mean in conventional milk 31% of the time. And because of all the pasteurization, it destroys the safety systems that were originally put into milk for us to be able to digest it and, and fight those germs. And um, there are always, there are constantly large scale creamery contaminations that cause massive food, uh, foodborne outbreaks. And there's a lot of antibiotics used. So as you see, conventional, I mean, certified organic is a bit better. But again, the Ross certified is much better. So you have like, okay, good, better. Okay, and that's, you know, I'm not going to go through every aspect of it. I will give this to you as a handout, and you can choose for yourself. 
but nutrition wise as well if you look at the difference in nutrition um, again raw is going to be the best choice there okay so looking at this the healthiest choice when it comes down to it after I have researched reflected experimented on myself you know this has been a journey for me as well um, many years in the making that's why I know this is a lot for some people and you must be like well, what the heck am I supposed to eat now you know after my last lecture someone said to me now I don't know what to eat thanks a lot <laughs> but that's not why I'm doing it I'm doing it just so you are aware of what's happening and you can make choices for yourself slowly I did not change my diet overnight trust me it's been a process it's still a process um, but I'm trying to find the healthiest choices for, for myself and my family. And so what, I've, what I have found is that the healthiest choice has been um, grass-fed products because that's what they're supposed to be eating. Doesn't it make sense that grass-fed would be the best because that's their natural diet? So, you know, since the late 1990s, there's been a growing number of ranchers that have stopped sending their animals to the feedlots to be fattened on grain, soy, and other supplements. Instead, they're keeping their animals at home on the ranch and on the range, and they're letting them, you know, forage on the pasture. Pasture. They're letting them have their native diet. You know, if you take a ride like anywhere upstate, you know, um, you'll, you'll see animals grazing. So it's a beautiful sight. You know, because they're out in their, in their environment, and that's what they should be eating. So these are the, that, those pasture-fed animals. And so what they're doing is they're not treating their animals with, because they're more in their environment and they're eating their diet, they're not getting as sick as these animals that are in these factory farms. Because they're where they should be. They're outside in the sun. They're with their friends. They're eating their food. So they're not having the same problems. And so obviously they don't have to be treated with all these chemicals and added, you know, and hormones and stuff. So they lead low stress lives. And so obviously they're going to be healthier choice for our bodies as well. Remember, you are what you eat. So if you put in an animal that's been tortured and, you know, given hormones and antibiotics and everything, that's becoming a part of you. You know, um, once you start eating better, and then you eat something that's not the best choice because you know you go out to restaurants most you know these restaurants are not giving you pasture fed organic meats you go to a typical restaurant they're giving you okay the, you know what's the best for our profit our bottom line so once you start eating better and then you eat that you can feel the difference in your own body you know you start feeling like as a woman we can feel the hormones right a woman feels when her hormones are up or down. If you eat meat that has been conventionally raised, full of hormones and all that, you can feel it in your body. I'm going to ask all the women here to give it a try one day. <laughs> but um, eat, and what I mean is you're going to feel it um, in certain parts of your body, let's say. Your breasts can become more tender because of the added hormones. You can feel it in your body. I've experimented that within myself, that I'm like, why am I feeling this? And it's because I ate food that had hormones in it. And I can then feel it in my own body because it starts to become my body's processing those hormones. Now, do you think it's a good idea to be putting extra hormones in your body when we already have our own system, right? Our hormones are, are regulating everything within our body. If we start putting in whatever hormone the farmer thought the cow needed, what is that doing to us? And so they're saying that this is causing all these outbreaks, so much more cancer and so many more illnesses because we're putting in stuff that we shouldn't have in our bodies. But the good news is there is an alternative. You know, there are these grass-fed products. So um, one of your resources as well is going to be, um, it's called eatwild.com. And it's fabulous because it's a state-by-state -state directory of farms that actually will offer you grass-fed products. And you can even choose to buy like a quarter of a cow, a half a cow, a whole cow, you know, split it with your friends, know the animal, what their diet was, what their, you know, how they were raised. I know that might be too intimate for some of you, but isn't that better <laughs> than not knowing what you're eating, right? 
I mean, I personally would rather know the cow. I don't mean I want to go, sh you know, hang out with the cow because then I'll never eat it. But I would rather know that this cow ate this and was treated humanely. And then, you know, after, when it's lived a good life, it's ready to, you know, to, if you're going to eat meat, to die and to, to eat that. But, um, you know, it's better than not knowing what you're eating. So pasture fed products are just better overall, higher vitamins, higher antioxidants, you know, no added hormones. So if you do want to eat meat, eggs, dairy products, I encourage you to get the healthiest choice, which would be the grass fed products. Okay. And um, when you do choose the pasture fed products, you know, you're improving the welfare of the animals. You're helping to put an end to, an, uh, to the environmental problems that are happening. You're voting for something better, right? You're helping small-scale ranchers and those family farms stay afloat. And you're helping to um, give your family the healthiest options available. You know, you have to think about what's going in your mouth. You have to think about what you're giving to your family. We have, we, you know, we think food comes from the supermarket. It doesn't come from the supermarket. It started out somewhere else. And we have to start becoming aware of where that is. Or else we're just going to become a kink in the chain. So if we want to make a difference in our lives, we have to be aware of what we're putting into ourselves. And I, when I talk about that, it's not only food, right? It's impressions. It's what's happening in our daily lives. Choosing movies that are good for your consciousness. Choosing food that's going to be good for your consciousness. Right? All of that is going to affect your, <clears throat> your spiritual work. So if you can, choose pasture-fed products. Okay. All right, we're going to move on to B products. This, does, this is much better. Not as heavy, <laughs> much easier to talk about. Um, you know, B products have been around for thousands of years. Okay? It's a great form of protein, especially if you're a vegetarian and you don't want to eat you know, um, any kind of uh, flesh foods. It's a great energy booster. It's an immune system uh, builder. It's got so many you know, natural remedies for so many ailments. If you look up like, you know, what honey is good for, you will find that it's good for a variety of ailments. And um, always try to buy local when you can because it's going to have what's in your environment. And so it's going to help you to fight um, allergies. And it's always better to buy local. So one bee product that there is out there is raw honey. And, you know, raw honey is the honey that comes out of the beehive. It hasn't been heated. Okay, so it's just what's coming out. And it actually contains small particles of wax as well. So if you buy raw honey and you put it in your tea, you'll have like this little wax stuff floating around. Don't worry about it. You can drink that too. Um, raw honey is great because uh, people who suffer from allergies, um, if, you, if you do suffer from allergies, try to get your local honey, raw honey, because um, the pollen impurities lessen the sensitivity to hay fever. Since you're going to be getting all the pollen that's in your natural environment, it's going to lessen your hay fever reaction. So you should start out like, um, I buy it at my local farmer's market, and you start building it, your, like your immunity up. Like during the winter time, you just keep having that, that raw honey. And when hay fever will start, you won't have reactions to it. Uh, I always suffered from hay fever. This year I had no hay fever which was beautiful. And all I did was I added raw honey and some bee pollen, and obviously I eat better, but I didn't suffer from allergies. So uh, most honey that you find in the supermarkets is not raw. It's commercial honey. They've heated it. They've cleaned it. It looks lovely. It's beautiful. It's clear, but it's not raw honey. And so what happens is a lot of the good stuff that honey has, all the vitamins and enzymes and uh, natural antioxidants, has, you know, it's lessened. So the honey that you buy in the store, unless it says raw honey, it's already been processed. So when you can, try to get uh, raw honey. Don't give honey to babies, though, less than a year old, okay, because their immune systems aren't strong enough yet. Um, and because there, there is bacteria in honey that we can handle, like our guts can handle killing that bacteria off, but because the immune systems of babies isn't strong enough, don't give it to them under the, year of, um, under the age of one. Okay. But raw honey is a, is a great thing. Put it in your tea, put it in your, 
you know, use it as a sweetener. I use it in my smoothies. This morning I knew I needed energy for my lecture, so I made myself a nice smoothie. I stuck in strawberries and blueberries and collard greens for my garden. Bee pollen, raw honey, cacao, flaxseed oil. <laughs> um, my husband says, what is this, mud? <laughs> you know, he had let it sit for a while and then it thickened. <laughs> but um, I said, just add some, you know, apple cider to it. But uh, it, was still, it was really good because it has everything in there, you know. It had everything I needed to have my day uh, filled with energy. And I do. I feel good, you know. But it's, it's a nice energy. It's not like drinking coffee and getting that woof up and down. I have a nice consistent energy. So... Um, Raw honey is a good option. So this is bee pollen. If you look at slide uh, 22, you'll see what bee pollen actually looks like. I did put this in my smoothie as well. And it's good to get local bee pollen. Um, the farmer's market here sells it, so if anyone's interested, I'll be going after the lecture. Pick you up some bee pollen. It's really good. It's considered actually one of those perfect foods because it has, um, scientists say it has everything needed for a human to survive. The composition of it, it's made up of 50% carbohydrates, 35 to 40% protein, 3% minerals and vitamins, and 2% fatty acids. It says that um, 35 grams of bee pollen daily contains all the nutrients our body needs to sustain life. That's how powerful it is. Now, I'm not saying just eat bee pollen. <laughs> I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is it has complete nutrients. So supplementing your diet with bee pollen is a great way to make sure that you're getting all the nutrients in there. But if you're allergic to bees, uh, it would be best to avoid bee pollen. Okay? Uh, the bee pollen is actually it's, it's the, um, created by the bees from the pollen of the male stamen of the flowers. So as they travel from uh, flower to flower, they have these, the worker bees collect the um, pollen granules and they stack it, they put them in this nest that they um, these pollen baskets that they have on the back of their legs, and they collect it from flower to flower, and then they bring it back to the hive. And that's actually um, what, they, what they will feed the other bees with. So it's really great. It's, it's like, and it's hard, which is very interesting. When you see it, it's like a, it's a hard little granule. But it's a great thing to have and to put into your, into your smoothies or into cereals on top of your cereal if you're going to eat it or something like that to include it in your diet. Has anybody had bee pollen before? No? All right. Something to try. Something new. Okay. Another product from bees is called Royal Jelly. Okay, royal jelly is um, a milky white substance from the beehive, and um, it's another incredible product. It's highly uh, nutritious, glandular secretion of the young bees. It's used to feed the queen, bree queen bee and the young brood. Um, it you know, contains a lot of amino acids, and it helps you to fight infections and build up your immune system. And it's also a strong antibiotic. So um, it's been known for a variety of, of things as well, like more energy, healthier skin, youthful appearance. So all the women out there who, you know, we, we want to keep that, eat some royal jelly, include that in your diet as well. Um, again, people allergic to specific pollen should be careful with it. So if you are sensitive to certain pollen, um, test it out on yourself. See how it reacts. Okay, but it's, it is full of um, vitamins B1, B2, B6, so many different types of vitamins, and it's just a, it's a great thing to add to your diet as well. So if you like, um, if you always sweeten your coffee or, or your tea with um, sugar, switch over to honey, you know, and see how that reacts in your body. Again, experiment with your body. Okay. So um, beans are another form of protein. And beans are a wonderful way to get high-quality plant-based protein to your diet, okay? It um, contains a more complete set of amino acids than any other plant food. To make it more complete, though, you should make sure that you combine it with either brown rice, seeds, corn, wheat, or nuts, because alone, it doesn't have the complete protein that you, you would need for um, a complete meal. So whenever you have beans, and it's only beans that you're eating and nothing else, make sure you combine it with one of these other grains, because that'll make it a complete meal for you, okay, Nutrition, nutritious, nutritiously speaking, nutritionally speaking. 
Yeah, try to say that. Okay. So it's high in vitamin, in iron, B vitamins, and fiber. Um, if you have trouble digesting beans, try the smaller beans. Okay. Some people are like, I cannot eat beans. You know, it just doesn't make you a pleasant companion after a few hours. But there are ways to deal with that. Smaller beans like split peas, mung, and azuki beans, they're much better. Okay, so if you have, if you're not used to eating beans, or if you have trouble digesting be digesting beans, try the smaller versions first. Okay, um, they stay fresh. Beans stay fresh. And when I say beans, I'm not meaning canned beans. Okay, I'm, I'm meaning fresh, dried beans. Okay, uh, we don't advocate eating canned food. So when we're talking about beans, we're talking about fresh, and they stay uh, fresher longer if you keep them in a cool, dark place rather than on your countertop. Okay, so cool, dark, and don't use beans that are more than a year old. Uh, their nutrient content, you know, is less. They're going to be harder to digest. Okay, and um, you'll get more side effects. Okay. <laughs> So if we look at beans and the protein in beans, if you take a look here, I started from like which bean has the most protein, and I'm talking about one cup cooked, okay? So um, soybeans have the most at 29 grams, but they're the hardest to digest. And I'll talk about soybeans in a minute. Lentils, 18 grams of um, protein per cup. So those are really high. And those adzuki beans that I was talking about, 17 grams. So as you see on this list um, on slide 25, there are plenty of options bean-wise to eat. You do not have to have a steak every day to get your protein. As you see, there's plenty of protein in a bean. Now some people say, but I don't know how to cook a bean. Well, I'm going to show you how to cook a bean and how to make it more digestible. Okay. Um, before I do that, I want to talk about soybeans. They are the most difficult to digest. Um, people traditionally ate soybeans, um, the young ones called edamame. If you look on slide 26, you see the small green ones on top. They've become quite popular, edamame, and um, <clears throat> that's how they were traditionally eaten or fermented. Okay, so in foods like um, tofu, tempeh, miso, and tamari. Asian people have eaten soybeans for, you know, thousands of years, but they ate it fermented in those forms. And so nowadays, people are, if you look on the bottom of the, of the slide, that's what a soybean looks like, and people are starting to eat that more often. But what happens is um, that's harder to digest, and people have a lot of allergic reactions to soy. So, um, and not only that, but it's, it's a really, there one of the biggest GMO crops out there these days. So if you are going to buy soybeans, make sure you get them organic, okay, because um, they're full of chemicals and pesticides. So, but the best way to eat a soybean would be through the fermented process, okay? So um, I've tried them this way as well. I mean, they're okay. They're not my favorite bean, but um, I do enjoy them uh, as tofu or tempeh, miso, tamari, and those have uh, quite a few good health benefits to them as well. Okay. So to make beans more digestible, because sometimes people say, well, okay, I get a lot of gas after I eat beans. All right, well, let's talk about how to make them more digestible. If you soak your beans, so if you get those fresh dried beans and you soak them for um, at least eight hours, Okay, so in four parts water to one part bean, kidney and garbanzo beans need longer soaking, at least 24 hours. Okay, so if you are going to make kidney or garbanzo, just let them soak longer. You could change the water as well. Okay, you don't have to leave it in the same water, especially 24 hours, the water could get a little funky. So just clear it out and put the, um, the beans in there. Sprouting the legumes, sprouting the beans actually makes it even easier to digest. So if you keep the beans in the water for longer than 24 hours, and you, keep, you have to switch the water quite a few, you know, at least twice during that time period, if you let it go for like two, three days, you'll start noticing that they start sprouting. And it's a really, you're, I did that once by accident, because <laughs> I left my beans and I kept changing the water, and all of a sudden I start sprouting. And, but when you cook them, then it becomes even easier for your body to digest because they're letting out all these enzymes. You know, they're starting to sprout. They're starting to become the flower, the plant that they were supposed to be. And so um, 
that's a really nice way to, to eat beans as well, especially if you're new to beans or if you have problems digesting beans. Okay, so let them sprout. Soak them for two, three days, changing the water, you know, every day a few times. Um, another way to make beans more digestible is adding seaweed. All right, so uh, a six to eight inch piece of seaweed, you could use kelp, wakame, kombu, and you can buy these in your Asian section in the supermarket. Most stores are now carrying these, and it's a great way um, to add minerals, even more minerals to your beans. So anytime I make beans or soup, I throw in a piece of kombu or wakame because I'm getting more minerals. Our bodies are so mineral deficient with the way that we're eating these days that anytime I could throw in extra minerals, I do. And so I always keep a package of, um, a few packages of seaweed actually in my, in my pantry. And I just throw it in there every chance I get. Uh, recommended is to soak your seaweed for 30 minutes and then take the seaweed and throw it in the pot of beans. And then add that water to um, your beans later on in the cooking process. Okay, it's full of minerals that we're not typically getting through our diet. By, soak, by soaking the beans as well, we're making the skin softer, and um, that improves digestibility. Okay. Also, um, we get rid of, some beans have what's called phytic acid, and, um, which inhibits um, calcium absorption. So when you soak your beans, you get rid of that. Same with brown rice. Whenever you eat brown rice, you should always soak it overnight. Okay, because of the phytic acid in it. Um, the seaweed, what it actually does is it, um, it's very grounding for the beans, and it gives you all those minerals, and it also shortens the cooking time. Okay, so it won't take as long. Don't ever add salt to your beans when you're cooking them, okay, because that keeps them harder, and it inhibits them from, from uh, cooking properly. If you do add salt, you add them at the end. Like the last five minutes of cooking, you put your salt in. So you never put salt in with your cooking time. And whenever you're cooking your beans, remove the foam from foam that's formed on top because that's also creates the gas. And that's so, oh, I didn't mention, when you soak your beans, don't use that water to cook it with. Like drain that water and then add fresh water and then cook your beans, okay? Um, Certain spices also help with the digestibility. So, for example, if you add a bay leaf, that's going to help with the digestibility. Fennel, anise, cumin, ginger, coriander, epazote, all of those will also help um, with improving digestibility um, and aid in digestion. Um, basil, sage, thyme, oregano enhance the flavor of bean dishes. So... If you do have a lot of gas as a result of beans, fennel, anise, bay leaves, really good, or cumin, ginger, coriander, all those will help with gas. Okay. And adding vinegar to the last stages of cooking um, helps reduce indigestion as well as softening the beans and breaking them down. So, um, but make sure you put unpasteurized vinegar. Okay, so apple cider vinegar is a good choice, brown rice or white wine vinegar. So, it, you know, I like, I'd like you to experiment with beans. There are so many types of beans out there, right? If you look at that bean list, have you tried all those beans? Right? Some? Yeah, some I don't even, exactly. There are some on there, you're like, what the heck are those beans? So get out there and try them because the more, you know, you, you try new proteins and new foods, you're going to see different reactions as well in your body. Um, this week I did an experiment in my pantry. Um, I didn't go food shopping last weekend because we had house we had guests over and, and I usually go shopping every Sunday and I couldn't. So I'm sitting there on Monday, you know, had made dinner with whatever I had and uh, I said, oh, let's go food shopping. And so my husband says, well, let's go tomorrow. I'm tired today. I said, okay. And then I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, well, wouldn't it be fun to just try and make meals, as many meals as possible without going food shopping to see what I can come up with, right? And so a minute later he says, hey, how about we go food shopping, you know, during the weekend and we just use everything we have. So obviously he was reading my mind at that point and um, I took it as an experiment and I said, okay, great. 
And so I started, and then I started posting the photo on Facebook and what I made for the day, just to, as part of this experiment. And it really started to encourage people as well to like start cooking. And it surprised me what I could make with what I had. And um, what I realized I had a lot of was grains and beans. So like you know, I started using my brown rice more and my beans and my you know quinoa and this and that and. What it showed me was sometimes we get very used to what we cook, and if we're out of that, we go to the store and we buy it, right? This sort of forced me out of my comfort zone and go, hmm, well, what am I going to make today? <laughs> you know, like I have to start searching in my pantry. Uh, I mean, I made probably quite elaborate meals compared to the average person because my pantry is quite big, <laughs> but. Um, it just showed me that I need to experiment as well. You know, you get used to eating in a certain way, and I really just got out of it, and, and I had to, to play with the food I had. Today would be the last day of my experiment. I, I should go food shopping. A friend of mine said I should do it for seven more days to see what happens, but I don't know. It's getting kind of tight now. Um, I do miss garlic. <laughs> I have no garlic or olive oil in the house, so I've been using a lot of ghee. Um, but it's been interesting. So. It's a good experiment to see what you come up with. It makes you, it forces your creativity as well. So, if you want to try an experiment, that's a really good one. <laughs> so, the next thing I want to talk about protein-wise are grains. So, grains are a staple in all countries, right? Any country you go to, they have their native grains, uh, what they're used to eating. And grains are an excellent um, source of nutrition. They have you know, lots of enzymes, iron, dietary fiber, vitamins E and B complex. Um, they also, because the body absorbs grains slowly, they provide sustained and high quality energy. Okay, so a whole grain, and I'm talking about whole grains. When you eat a whole grain, your energy level is going to be more constant. So if you're a person who suffers from like fluctuating energy levels, take a look at what you're eating. Are you including whole grains into your diet? And you know, when I when I say whole grains, I'm meaning, you know, rice, millet, quinoa, buckwheat, oats, oatmeal. And I'm not talking about the oatmeal that you get in the bag and you stick in the microwave for a minute with all the sugar. I'm talking about real oatmeal, right? Whole oatmeal. Um, quinoa, high in protein, right? Anyone know what quinoa is? It's become popular these, these last couple years. It's great protein. Try it out. You know, every time I go to the store, I try to find one new thing I haven't tried. And then I stick it in my pantry. <laughs> and then I cook it when I have nothing else to cook. But uh, the point is, get it, try it, and uh, it's, whole grains are fabulous for you. You know, when you make a meal, your plate should look like, you know, not just a piece of meat and a potato, right? Reminds you of your food, right? Uh, a friend of mine was saying, yeah, his plate was like a piece of meat and what else? Silverware. And silverware, okay. <laughs> so so that, was, <laughs> that was his dinner, you know, a, a steak and his fork and knife. So I said, well, are you eating whole grains? You know, do you have a portion of whole grains and do you have vegetables? No, just a steak. I said, okay, well, there's your problem because he's saying, but I'm hungry. He says, I have to eat a big steak because I'm hungry. I said, well, what else are you eating with the steak? Okay, protein should be the size of your palm and not six inches thick. Okay, <laughs> size of your palm and then the thickness of your palm. That's a normal portion, right? So a steak shouldn't be this big. In America, we get steaks like this now, right? And we get this little salad. <laughs> oh, and a potato with sour cream and butter too, of course. Very nutritious. So as you're making your meal, you know, I love to plate my food. <laughs> my husband laughs because I keep taking photos of every meal, right, and posting it on Facebook. <laughs> but so I do like this little artistic thing. I put it, it's like my, you know, my blank canvas, and then I start with my grains, and then I'll put my vegetables, and then I'll put my protein, and, you know, and then I turn the plate around and take a photo at every angle. But what it does is it's making me appreciate the whole process. It's not just about shoving the food in my mouth. It's about cooking with good energy. <clears throat> it's about sharing ideas with friends. You know, it's about feeding my family the best food I can give it. 
And so he makes fun of me, too, because he's just I'm like, so do you like it? <laughs> you know, I don't know who else. Do you, does it taste good? He's like, yeah, it's good. I'm like, but tell me about it. What do you think? <laughs> does it have enough spice? Should I do this the same way next time? Should I, you know? And I've been doing this to him for 10 years now. I tell him he should know by now. He still doesn't get it. Um, he's trying, but, um, you know, I like feedback, right? <laughs> Being the cook in the family, you want to know, right? You don't want someone just to go, rah, 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 shove it down, and then afterwards you're like, did you like it? Yeah, it's good. <laughs> you know, you want to know. You want feedback. You want to see if it's good. Is the person feel good afterwards eating it? You know, that's another question. I say we, <laughs> we have a person in the audience who eats like that. <laughs> yes? Um, but... You know, food should be an experience, you know, and one thing I have struggled with food-wise is eating quickly. In my family, you would sit down and you would eat fast and then you would go on to the next thing, right? And so I, I really have to make it a conscious effort to, like, I turn off everything. You know, maybe classical music will be playing, but usually there's not. And that I call mealtime, right? And we sit down and it's, if we want to talk, we talk or... You know, sometimes we don't even have to talk and just enjoy the food. But it's about the experience. And that, I've noticed, helps me digest my food better. I feel better afterwards. So try it. If, if you're one of those people who, you know, just shoves it down and goes on to the next thing, try doing it differently and see how it affects your feeling in your body. Put your fork down and your knife down between every bite. What? <laughs> yes, you can actually put it down. <laughs> you know, you don't have to actually hold them the whole time. <laughs> no one's going to take it away. Put it down. Try it. Take your bite. Put your fork and knife down. The first time I did that, it was weird. I was like, oh, wow, I could actually put my fork and knife down between bites. And it gave me a different experience. And also what it does, it'll help you uh, become fuller quicker because you're going to take more time to eat. It's not actually quicker, it's just psychologically quicker. Because 20 minutes is the time it takes for the message from your stomach to reach your brain to tell you you're full. So if you're finishing your meal in five minutes, and then you're like, oh, I'm still hungry. Yeah, you're still hungry because you, your stomach hasn't told your brain yet that you're full. That's how long it takes for that message to get there. So, if you want seconds, I encourage you to wait 20 minutes. And then, if you're still hungry, eat. But if you're not, I, I can almost guarantee you, you will not be hungry after those 20 minutes if you ate a normal portion. So, um, my husband has learned that. <laughs> he has learned. He, he eats, and then right away he's like, oh, I could eat more. He's like, no, no, but I have to wait for my brain to, you know, <laughs> hear my stomach. <laughs> And then after the 20 minutes, he's like, yeah, I'm not hungry anymore. So it does work. So give it a try, okay? Because just eating like that unconsciously, you know, we, we, we'll definitely overeat. And that's what's happening with America, right? We're eating so much because we're eating too fast. We don't ever give our brains the chance to catch up with our stomachs. So try it. And let me know what happens. I like experiments. All right, so eat more whole grains. They'll fill you up, okay? Steak and whole grains, and then a vegetable, okay? And a vegetable, when I say vegetable, I don't mean potato and corn only. I mean greens, okay? We, our first lecture was about greens, all right? Eat the greens. Every meal, you should have something green on your plate. Breakfast, I had collard greens in my shake, you know? And that helps me to feel more energized. Greens are full of energy. Grains are full of energy. Those are alive. Meat is dead. Right? So what do you think is going to give you, you know, it's going to give you different energy, but what's going to give you more life force? Live foods. Raw honey. Raw milk. Greens. Fruits. Oh, that's what I missed during my experiment this week. Fresh fruit. <laughs> I had frozen fruit only. That I missed a lot. It was fresh fruit. So get the fresh foods in your body. If we take a look at slide 29, you'll see proteins in grains. Look at how much protein there, there is in grain. So you don't, you know, that, that 
that myth in our minds of having just a steak because I need protein is baloney. It's not baloney, it's a steak, but you know what I mean. It means that you can get grains from protein, from, from grains. You could get, okay, you could get protein from grains. You could get protein from beans. You could get protein from bee products. You could get, you know, this is, protein is coming from all these sources. And we've just been conditioned because of the meat industry and the dairy industry to believe we need meat or chicken or fish every meal. Meanwhile, look at all the protein in these foods. So experiment with these as well. Have you tried all of these? <laughs> no, right? Get them. Some of them, you know, you may be like, oh, I don't like this. And others, you might be like, wow, this is really good. One thing I didn't know I liked was spelt. I like spelt now. I'm like, wow, spelt is really good, you know, or quinoa. Quinoa is another great one. I, have to, I haven't tried teff yet, so I have to try some teff. And amaranth is really nice as well. Couscous, that's pretty popular these days. You probably had that. But look at that. That's all sources of protein. So do you need that whole steak alone? No, cut the steak in a quarter and then add some grains, you know, add some vegetables, and that's a balanced meal. And then take a picture and send it to me. <laughs> okay, so um, symptoms of too much protein. If you are one of those protein eating, you know, and I'm, I'm steak eating people every day, or too, you know, some people eat that every day, and then they have low energy and constipation. They're dehydrated. They feel lethargic. Uh, there's weight gain. They have a lot of cr sweet cravings, um, bad body odor. All of these are signs of too much protein. So if you're um, eating too much protein and you're feeling these symptoms, that's your body's way of telling you, cut down on that animal protein. Okay. Try and incorporate more of the grains and the beans and the greens. All right. these, um, if your kidney, for example, um, kidney function declines, when we eat animal products, that puts a lot of stress on our kidneys because it has to process all of the toxins and the waste. So we have a lot of kidney issues. There's um, also calcium loss because of the acidic status in our body. When we eat animal products, it creates an, an acidic environment in our body. Acidic environments in our body, um, germs love acidic environments. You know, cancer cells love acidic environments. Any kind of like um, sicknesses love acidic environments. So if your body is very acidic, you're more likely to get sick. Okay. So what we have to do is eat more uh, whole fruits, more vegetables, more grains, more beans, more uh, all that will try, will create more of an alkaline uh, body. Um, status in our body, but any kinds of meat are going to create more acid. Sweets create more acidic acid in our bodies. So if you're a big sweet meat eater, you know, sweets and meat, that's your choice of foods, you're going to have a lot of acid in your body. So you need to balance it off with other foods that are, that are going to be better for you. Okay. So if you're experiencing these symptoms regularly, it's probably because you have too much protein going on in your body. And then symptoms of too little protein, um, you're craving a lot of sugar and sweets, you feel spacey, jittery, tired, you're losing a lot of weight. You know, people who, um, who turn towards a, a vegan or vegetarian diets and don't know how to eat, you know, there are plenty who don't know how to eat properly, they may start experiencing stuff like this because they're not eating, they're just being junk food vegetarians. You know the junk food vegetarians who go, well, I'm not eating meat anymore. So they go out and have pizza and beer and french fries and, you know, that, that's their idea. And hummus, that's all they eat. You know, hummus, beer, pizza, french fries. That's called a junk food vegetarian. So they think they're doing good because I don't eat meat. But what are you eating? And so a lot of times they'll start getting symptoms like this and a lot of weight gain, actually. They, they tend to gain a lot of weight because um, they're not eating properly. 
So it's very rare for Americans to suffer from this because the amount of protein that we eat, very rare. So um, what I encourage you to do as you're thinking about your protein consumption, your choices, think about you know, your heritage, think about your blood type. We'll do lecture series, I guess, on blood type because that affects how you eat as well. Think about your activity levels. Not everybody needs so much protein. Now, if you're out there physically working the land, or you're a construction worker, or you're, you know, then you need more protein. But if you're sitting at your desk, typing for eight hours a day, do you think you need that much protein going on in your body? Probably not. You could balance it off with a lot of lighter foods. So you've got to really, um, it's a personal choice. What I've done through these lectures is provided you protein choices but you need to experiment and see what's right for your body. Okay, because really it's, it's a different amount for every person. So I just um, touched on vegetarianism. You know, some people think, oh, to be spiritual, I need to be vegetarian. And so a lot of people um, choose to be vegetarian um, thinking it's going to make them more spiritual. And I, I want to read to you something that Master Samael Ambeo said about the vegetarian diet. It says, the majority of people believe that food without meat is incomplete. Nothing is more erroneous because science has demonstrated that nutrition obtained from vegetables has a greater sustaining power. All animals carry within the poisons of putref putrefaction. The venous blood is full of carbonic acid and other noxious substances. These harmful and repugnant substances are found everywhere in meat. And when we eat those foods, we fill our bodies with these toxins. And, you know, he wrote this how many years ago? Like, you know, a long time ago. And now we have more chemicals and toxins in the meat. Abundant proof exists, which demonstrates that a carnivorous diet stimulates ferocity. Let us observe the ferocity of the beasts of prey and the cruelty of the cannibals. And compare, and compare them with the prodigious strength and docility of cattle, of the elephant, of the horse. Right? And they're all grass eaters. However, let us not jump to the conclusion that everyone should give up eating meat once and for all and dedicate themselves to vegetarian eating. It would be crazy for a person to change his ordinary diet, which he has been using for years and which is nourishing him adequately. To eliminate meat from the ordinary diet of the people accustomed to it would completely undermine their health. The only sure way to proceed is by first experimenting and studying things. That's what we're doing here, experimenting and studying, right? You should be very careful with your nutrition. We do not ask you to give up meat once and for all, but we do warn you that meat, when consumed in large quantities, for example, every day, is like poison for the body. Dr. Arnold Krumheller, professor of medicine of the University of Berlin and great Gnostic doctor, sustained that man should consume 20% of his food as meat. 20, not 100. Okay. We have verified that some foods, such as wheat, eggs, avocados, etc., can substitute meat. Grains, in general, are a great nutri nutritive value. The protein of cow milk is marvelous. Again, cow milk, raw cow milk would be better, right? Milk from soybeans is very nutritious, and its chemical composition is similar to that of cow milk. Foods should be used in a balanced manner so as to p obtain the best nutrition. Avoid eating white bread. White flour is harmful and does not contain any nourishment. Eat black bread, whole breads, whole grains, plantains and corn flour instead of white bread and white flour. Eat many vegetables. Remember that vegetables are fountains of great nourishment. Vitamins are found in vegetables. That came from Master Samael, and that was, uh, what, at least 40 years ago. So we even have to be more careful these days um, with our choices of food. So, you know, there are many reasons why people do avoid meat, and these are just some of them. Um, like I said, I, I'm not advocating to be a vegetarian or not to be a vegetarian. What I am advocating is finding out what works for you. Okay, if you are a vegetarian um, and you don't know why you really are, you're just doing it to do it, and you don't feel good being a vegetarian, start experimenting. It's okay to experiment, right? This is your laboratory. You've got to make it work the best for you. Um, I know people who were vegetarians for many years, 
and but they didn't feel great being vegetarians. And then they slowly started incorporating more protein, other forms of protein in their body, and then they felt better as a result. You know, don't don't try to be a, a dogmatic vegetarian just because the theory in your mind is great. If some people it works very well to be vegetarian and their body asks for that. But what I ask you to do is listen to see if that's true for you as well. You know, not everybody is meant to be a vegetarian and some people are. Some people for generations and generations are vegetarians because that's what their, you know, heritage is and their bodies are used to. So, <coughs> find out what that is for you. Come on. Um I like this quote by Master Samael. It says, If by avoiding the eating of meat we would become thoroughly self-realized, I can assure you that even if I died because of it, I would stop eating meat and would advise others to stop eating meat. But nobody will become more perfect because he does not eat meat. It says, um, he goes on to say, It is better for us to not wash our hands like hypocrites and to not boast of being saints. The hour has arrived in which we must become more comprehensive. What is important is to die within ourselves, here and now. Nevertheless, with these statements, I do not want to deny the selection of our food. In no way would I advise, for instance, pork. It is already known that pigs are leprous and that they have a very brutal psyche that harms our organism. Healthy food is convenient cattle, meat, chicken, but without reaching excesses, because excesses are harmful and damaging. Well, my dear brothers and sisters, I believe that with what I have said about vegetarianism, you have enough guidance in order to know how to nourish your body without deficiency or excess, within a perfect equilibrium. That is all. So, keep that in mind. <laughs> On slide uh, 35... <laughs> I found a very interesting graphic. So it's a man eating a boar, eating a, I think a dog or a wolf, eating a cat, eating a bird, eating a fly, eating poop. <laughs> okay? So <clears throat> this would be um, an example of the common cosmic trogo auto autoecocratic law. All right? Or, or the law to uh, swallow or to be swallowed or to eat or to be eaten, right? As we can see here, here's a good example of the food chain, right? And um, it's the reciprocal nourishment of all organisms. You know, the, unquestionably, the bigger fish will always small, swallow the smaller fish, and, you know, in the jungle, the, the cheetah is always going to get the, the weaker animal as well. Um, you know, even if you are a vegetarian, um, it doesn't matter how much of a vegetarian you are, in the coffin, you will be eaten by maggots. That's the reality. And that's, that's the cycle of life, right? That's an example of this law. So um, all organisms live on other organisms. Even the, you know, the bacteria, the germs on our bodies, they're living off of us, right? So everything relies on, on something. You know, uh, just a simple example of the food chain, right? If you look at that, you see um, who's eating what and how, and that's everywhere, right? And what happens is energy is transferred through a food chain. So once one animal eats another or an animal eats a plant, it's getting energy, right? And so in one form or another, we're part of that food chain, right? Whether we are vegetarian or not. Come on, mister. So, you know, in conclusion with this lecture series on proteins, um, I just want you to hopefully get that we should respect our body's needs. You know, um, many bodies need animal protein. You know, when we went on a retreat last uh, couple of years ago and we had a vegetarian diet for the week, many people were suffering. <laughs> we went to this Buddhist um, monastery and... Um, there were plenty who were really having a hard time with just eating vegetarian. And so one of our students snuck in chicken legs and was giving them out. <laughs> and there was like a congregation of young men eating chicken legs in one of these rooms because they, their bodies were asking for protein, animal protein. 
you know, especially young guys growing, you know, they need more food. So these, these, this way of eating, they were not used to. They didn't have enough energy. I, for example, I was fine. I didn't feel I was missing anything. I felt good. I was enjoying it, except for a little bit extra gas because of all the beans. It was fine, you know, but everything else was fine. So, um, but some people suffered. So you have to find out what is that for you, how much, you know, protein you need for your body. Um, if you are going to eat animal protein, I just encourage you to eat high quality, organic, or free range, pasture fed, grass fed animal protein. Choose the best for your body. Okay, if you cut down on the amount of protein, animal protein you eat and substitute other protein forms like grains and protein, when you do eat that animal protein, put a little bit more money into it and get the best that you can get. Because really, what are you paying for in the end? If you choose the steak that's you know two ninety nine a pound because it's on sale, you know, but it's from a factory farm and it's full of antibiotics and hormones and a tortured animal, and then you have a choice of maybe a nine ninety nine smaller piece of meat, but that has more nutrition, has more um, you know vital energy, the animal had a better life, you know, is that really what's worth it? Eat a smaller piece of meat, but a better piece of meat, and it's going to make you feel better in the end as well. Remember, if the animal was healthy, you in turn will be healthy as well. Keep that in mind. Is this animal that I am buying here? Because it's an animal, right? It's not a steak. It's an animal. <laughs> we think if we put nice names to it, we don't think it's like, you know, if we call it, um, oh, this is poultry. It's not chicken, right? Or this is, you know, steak. It's not cow. But really, it's cow, it's pig, it's chicken, it's, you know, whatever it is. We think that way we have less attachment to it. Um, but the reality is, it's still the animal. So when you're choosing your animal, choose it wisely. You know, choose the best one that you can for yourself. Because in the end, that's going to become a part of who you are. So do you want, what do you want to have inside of yourself? becoming who you are. Do you want tortured animals to be a part of you? Or do you want healthy animals to be a part of you? Okay. Um, also, to help digest the animal protein, eat plenty of vegetables with your meal. The vegetables have enzymes in them, live enzymes, right? So protein is hard on the stomach, right? It takes a lot of energy for our stomach to digest it. So if you would put all those vegetables in with the, pro with the protein, you're going to help the digestion of your protein. So make sure if you are having it, half your plate should be vegetables, quarter of your plate should be protein, and a quarter of your plate should be a grain. How's that sound for a formula? Eh? Try it. <laughs> Try it. But again, you have to experiment with that. That's what works for me. It might be a little different for you. Okay? And... Um, Just experiment. That's what's going to help you find out your formula. So um, I'm going to end with the following by Master Samael. He said, the human body has as its foundation a vital body, the linga sarira, of which the theosophists speak. Beyond this vital depth, what exists within the, what exists within the organisms of these living and intellectual humanoids? The, anim the animalish aggregates, those psychic aggregates that personify our errors, those beastly monsters of our passions are what exist. Well then, it is better to eliminate those beastly monsters than to worry about the small piece of meat served at the table of the time of our meals. When we eat beef or chicken, we do not harm ourselves whatsoever. Nevertheless, we harm ourselves with all those beastly aggregates that we carry within. Moreover, we also harm our fellow men with them. And this is worse. I want to argue <clears throat> one point there. When he wrote this, we did not have factory farming methods. We did not abuse our animals as we do now. So when he says, um, when we eat beef or chicken, we do not harm ourselves whatsoever, I would beg to differ that point now um, with conventional food. Because the conventional food is harming us now. Okay, obviously the beastly aggregates, those egos we carry within, are harming us even more. And we need to focus on those as well. But we have to make sure that our temple is prepared for that battle. 
So make your temple strong, make your temple fed well, make your temple ready for that fight that we have to take, that we have to um, experience within ourselves. So choose the best that you can for your body because it's going to take you a long way. Okay. So um, some resources that I just want to end with. Um, for this lecture, um, there is, like I said, uh, Real Milk on page on slide 39. Realmilk.com will help you find local, uh, real, raw milk. Okay, so if you go there. Also on sustainabletable.org, great website for sustainable living. They had so many fabulous tools, ideas on how to eat better, how to just take care, you know, eat in a better way for the environment, for ourselves. I encourage you to check out sustainabletable.org. Um, farmsanctuary.org. There is a great report there on uh, the welfare of cattle in the dairy and dairy production. If you want to learn more about what's going on in dairy production, download that report. It's uh, free on the website there. And that movie that I'm going to show you is at uh, farmsanctuary.org slash media center slash videos. There are plenty of movies there. The one I'm going to show you, it's called It Doesn't Have to Be This Way. So those of you who are listening online, please go to farmsanctuary.org slash media center slash videos and download It Doesn't Have to Be This Way uh, and watch that. And lastly, the eatwild.com website. This is a really fabulous website. It has um, more than 1,300 pasture-based farms. So you can find great sources in the United States and Canada for pasture-fed products. Um, you know, animals that don't have all those hormones, antibiotics, who are living the life they should be living. And we could be eating that meat instead. Some actually deliver, like they'll mail it. Uh, some are like by mail, I don't know, they must package it in some ice and cold. Um, others you can actually go to the farm and pick it up and you could order, like I said, quarter cows, half cows, they have them by different animals and um, you could see, you can visit the farms, you could go see how they are raising their animals. Um, so it's a, it's a much more conscious way of choosing our food. So with that, um, I'll take some questions if you have and then we'll watch the movie that will make you all cry. <laughs> yes. Frozen, like vegetables. Organic frozen vegetables. Yep, that's a good option. They actually um, seal in the vitamins. It's uh, a good option. I keep frozen vegetables in my freezer. Actually, that's what that's what helped me this week with my experiment was my frozen vegetables. I always keep vegetables on stock, fresh and frozen. So they're a good option as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, you mentioned that uh, eating vegetables with meat. Um, helps to digest it because the vegetables contain enzymes. Mm -hmm. um, I know, for instance, I eat uh, a lot of vegetables, but I cook all the life out of my vegetables. <laughs> um, is uh, this a disadvantageous uh, procedure? Uh, do the enzymes survive the cooking process? Yeah, question is, do the enzymes survive the cooking process? You know, enzymes are live things, mm -hmm. right? If you are cooking them at you know, 150, 200 degrees, whatever is the amount you're cooking, do you think that enzyme is going to stay alive? That's the question. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's okay to eat cooked vegetables, but also include raw vegetables in your diet. Because if you're cooking the heck out of all your vegetables, you're cooking the heck out of the enzymes, the vitamins, the, you know, everything. Everything gets depleted the more you cook it. So, um, include a fresh salad, you know. Um, you know it's a great tool for fresh salads? Get one of those julienne peelers. I love my julienne peeler. I have, okay, it's like, it looks like a, a, like a vegetable peeler, but what it does is it shreds your vegetables into these nice, finely thin lines. So you take a carrot and you julienne it, and so it makes these really pretty, you know, it looks like you took a lot of time cutting your vegetables, and you can julienne all your vegetables this way, and it's fast, and it's easy, and your salad looks pretty, and it's raw, and all the end, you know, vegetables are there instead of having to chop. It's a really quick way to get a salad ready. So for like, you know, single guy like yourself, I would totally buy a Julian, you know, peeler, and um, have great salads all the time. 
Incorporate salads, raw food, even a bag of you know, raw vegetables as a snack. Take it with you to school or to work. Yes? Um, I was wondering if you could address the psychological dependence on certain foods. I think um, particularly, I was thinking with uh, meat, people um, often will say, well, my body needs a lot of meat. But in reality, they just think they need more meat. Than they, I think Americans consume a lot more meat than anyone human should mm -hmm. consume. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the psycholo psychological dependence upon meat. We think, especially Americans, we think we need meat. Well, you know, that just shows you how good marketing is with the meat industry, the cattle industry. That shows you what a great job they did in brainwashing us. Because um, they make a lot of money off of this industry, obviously. And so we are taught that, you know, the American meal, steak and potatoes, right? That's what we think is an American meal, or a hamburger and french fries, American meal, hot dog, American meal. This is all advertising, right? This is all advertising, and the reality of it is it's a habit at this point, or like you said, a dependence, a psychological dependence. If you start incorporating other foods into your body, you'll realize you do not need as much meat as you thought you needed. It's just, unless you're like, a bodybuilder, construction worker, farmer guy. You know, if your job is to be the construction worker, farmer, and bodybuilder, you're going to need probably a lot of protein. How many of us are all three in the, of those? Nobody. The average person is doing little physical activity in the day. Remember, what is your body? What's the reason we eat for? Energy. Energy. How much energy do you think you need if you're sitting on your butt all day? Not so much. Not so much. <laughs> And then you go and you have lunch and you have a huge cheeseburger, french fries. Oh, yeah, I needed that. <laughs> and then what happens after that? Oh, I need a nap. Okay, I'll have a coffee. Let me go get a big coffee. Then you have a coffee. Then you go and you have dinner and you're like, oh, I'm hungry again. Then you have a big steak and maybe some, you know, potatoes and maybe corn. Oh, I needed that. I work hard today. <laughs> Meanwhile, you sat on your butt most of the day. Okay. When we were farming, America was a farming country at one point, and they needed to have more protein because they burned so much energy. They needed to replenish their bodies with energy. So yes, maybe at one point this myth was true that we needed so much protein. How many of us are farmers today? Anybody here tilling the land at 4 a.m.? <laughs> yes, okay, sometimes occasional gardening, right? So maybe that day you need some more food. But on the typical day, how many of us are just sitting, studying, or on the computer, traveling in the car? Okay? Most of us are not that um, strenuously, working that strenuously physically. So what I encourage you to do is to experiment with your food choices. Take that steak and cut it in half. Keep half for tomorrow, half for today. And see what happens. And then add some grains and vegetables and see how your body responds. When you go to a restaurant and they give you that huge portion, ask for a to-go bag right away. And cut your meal in half. Put that half in a box and take that home for another meal. Because the average meal at a restaurant is worth two to three portions these days. At least. At least. You go to some of these restaurants and you're like, what? I'm supposed to eat all that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or buffets, right? Buffets are big these days. And so what happens when you go to a buffet? Ooh, I got to eat a lot. I pay for it. <laughs> so you go and you have two, three plates full of food, like a mountain, right? Well, I paid for it. I have to eat it. Yeah, you're going to pay for it later. <laughs> when your body's not feeling great or when you've created, you have illnesses in your body because of the choices of food you put in your body. Because you're high cholesterol and high blood pressure, and because of all the medications you have to be on, and the diabetes, because of what we're putting in our body. You know, all these illnesses that are happening these days, high blood pressure, diabetes, um, and um, high cholesterol, those are all basically food related. You have somebody who's really uh, overweight, lose weight and eat better, they're going to lose, like all those illnesses are going to basically go away. I've seen it firsthand. You know, as a health coach, I was coaching um, a man who was on maybe, um, he was on at least five, six medications. He was about 85 pounds overweight. 
and I did um, I did a program with him, a six month program, helping him to change his habits, show basically teaching him how to have better options, changing certain lifestyle habits, and um, within a year, within the actually within six months, he had already dropped like uh, sixty pounds, fifty sixty pounds, got off of all his medications, all his medications. This was a man who was religiously taking at least six medications because of all the illnesses he had, and it was weight related and the way he was eating. So firsthand experience, I can tell you, changing your diet is gonna change your life. Experimenting, cutting back on animal protein and incorporating other proteins in your body is gonna change your life. If you're one of these people who are saying, oh, <coughs> you know, I'm pre-diabetic. I won't mention names here, but we have one of those here. And he uh, will come and eat bagels and cakes and hamburgers and hot dogs and then go oh but I don't know why I'm pre-diabetic <laughs> everybody knows who I'm talking about and um, then he asks me for quick cures no, actually the curvy leaves have been working okay well I did it I did find, okay I did find one um, Ayurvedic principles of uh, curry leaves if you chew about 10 curry leaves a day it's supposed to help pre-diabetic people but that's not the solution to keep eating cakes, okay? <laughs> um, the solution is to lower your weight, eat better, and, you know, not have to produce those illnesses in our body. Yes? Uh, what is white bread and white bread? Well, white rice and white bread, what they do is they strip off all of the fiber. So here's the grain, right? right? And so what they do is they, because white is prettier, Right? They, everything white is supposed to be pretty. This is why they started doing this, because white rice was prized as more expensive, and white bread, you know, Wonder Bread looked fabulous on a sandwich. So what they do is they take the grain, and then they strip it, right? And what's left is just the, the inside, right? So all the good stuff that was around it, the fiber, and the vitamins, and all that good stuff was here, bye-bye. And you're left with just the center, you know? And that doesn't have much vitamins, nutrients, and minerals. So anything whole grain has all of that fiber. And so when you eat something that doesn't have that fiber content, it doesn't give you that, remember we were talking about that energy, that sustaining energy? What it does is it spikes like this. It gives you that high energy and then that low energy. So when you eat white bread, it'll go like this. It turns into sugar in your body because you don't have that fiber slowing down the carbohydrate digestion in your body. Fiber acts as like um, it slows down the sugar being released in your blood. So when you eat a whole grain, your energy goes like this, right? Consistent. When you eat any white bread products or white rice, it goes like this. Create sugar, sugar, and then woo, I'm tired now. Okay, so that's what white products do in our body. It doesn't have fiber acts as, uh, as a great regulator of sugar within our blood. So it's just spiking. It's just making you go on roller coaster. And that's why if you notice when you eat um, foods that ha are like, you know, if you have pizza or white flour, you feel great for like half an hour, right? Ooh, that was such good pizza. And then you're like, oh, I need a nap. Oh, goodness, I'm just tired. And you wonder, right? It's contagious, that yawn, isn't it? <laughs> and then uh, that's what happens. We get very tired after white products. Observe what happens with yourself. Yeah. Why is that when one person yawns, the other yawns? If you would experiment on that, right? That's funny. Any questions in the back? Good. Any other questions up front? Yes. What um, milk alternative can, compared to conventional cow milk tastes most like milk? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All right. I, I, tried a, I, I was traveling with a friend, and there was a, an organic store, mm -hmm. so we had to eat going to have milk for breakfast and one of our you know, eggs and stuff like that. Yeah. And we got some form of organic or raw milk. Mm -hmm. And it was terrible. It, it tasted nothing like milk. Was, you don't milk. know what kind it was? I don't know, but it was mm. awful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that's not helping us much, but so what, what, what alternatives what? to milk that taste most like milk. Yeah. All right, um, well, like I said, raw milk would be your best option. Does it tastes like milk? It, tastes, it is milk. <laughs> Of course, it's, it's real milk, <laughs> okay? So raw milk, um, but if you don't want an animal product, um, you can get, what I like is almond milk, 
Yeah, delicious. Almond milk or rice milk are fabulous. Have you tried it? You tried both? Almond and rice? Or just almond. Okay, try rice. Some people don't like almond, other people like rice. Um, you could get it sweetened, non sweetened. I don't know if you had the sweetened or the non sweetened. But um, yeah, I usually, if I use it, I use almond milk. But some people don't like it, they use rice milk. Um, I don't like to use soy milk too much because of the hormones and the, it has like effects in women's bodies. I don't like to play around with that. So um, I choose one of those options. Also, what's been really delicious that I love that I make on my own is cashew milk. <gasps> delicious. Um, you take cashews and you put them into like your blender and you grind them up fine. And then you take boiled water and you put it into the... Um, the ground up cashews and then you can add some sweetener some honey or agave nectar a little cinnamon if you like and blend that all together let it cool it's delicious yeah really nice yes Mm. And they're shipped over to the United States and then they're oh my. remade into liquid again. There's not really like anything. I haven't heard that one. The, uh, the question is about organic milk having shelf life longer than conventional milk. And um, the student heard that the milk is powdered and then it's uh, that comes from other country and then re liquefied. <laughs> but I haven't heard that. I will look into it. But um, the shelf life thing might be because of the ultra pasteurization. So um, if you look, not only do they pasteurize, some, th some places ultra pasteurize, meaning they heat up the milk even at a higher temperature than pasteurization. So that might be the reason for a longer shelf life. Yes? Is there a difference between naturally raised and organic? I've seen it on packages where the chicken says natural, mm -hmm. but it doesn't list that it was uh, cage-free or anything. It just yeah. no hormones, no steroids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the question is about uh, is there a difference between natural and organically raised animals? Be really careful with packaging these days. They've gotten very smart because they see people like the word natural, you know, or pasture fed. So you have to really read your labels well. Organic means that the animal also had to eat organic feed, not have. Um, uh, any steroids, hormones, but the feed also had to be organic, right? That's like the basic simple. Natural, okay, no organics, no hormones, but maybe it's being fed GMOs, okay? And that doesn't mean that natural, you think like the chicken's running around. No, it's probably in, in the factory farm, you know. Um, industry's getting very smart. So the best thing to look for is, um, you know, organic or pasture-fed, no hormones, no antibiotics. Like I said, go to that website, <coughs> uh, eatwild.com, and take a look at where you can find you know, the best options for yourself. Also, whole, because <coughs> a lot of labels just say wheat and grain. If it's not whole, it's also whole. Yeah, a lot of the grains, too, will say, oh, this is wheat bread. But then you read the ingredients, and it's like, you know, they use, um, it's white flour, basically, and then they put, like, molasses to change the color to make it you think that you're getting whole wheat but it's not even whole wheat so when you buy like a whole grain bread make sure it says whole wheat and look at the ingredients too. start reading your packages because if you can't pronounce the food like if, a, if they say do not buy anything that a third grader couldn't pronounce you know because that means that it's just chemicals you know, your, your foods should be as basic and as whole as possible. Remember what I told you? When is a food whole? It's when the only ingredient is itself. So an apple is an apple, right? Rice is rice. But when you start adding pizza to the picture, is pizza? Pizza? No, pizza is wheat and salt and cheese and tomato sauce. That's not a whole food. So a whole food is when the only ingredient is its own ingredient, is its one, th one thing itself. Eat as many whole foods as you can and you'll be healthier. Any other questions? Yes. Steph, is um, your opinion um, by people like uh, medium rare steak as opposed to 
opposed to well done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, what's the difference between people who like medium rare and well done? Yeah, yeah you were a cat in another life. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You know what? I do. It's true. Um, when I eat beef, I can't stand like overdone, well cooked, charred meat. I don't like it, right? And uh, my husband always says, "We'll get like an expensive cut." And he'll be like, "Well done, please." I'm like, "Oh, you're killing it, man! You're killing it!" You know? When I get it, I like it medium. You know? Because I like it to taste like beef, not like a piece of shoe leather. You know? <laughs> Do I have to what? Yeah, they say, you know, he, personally, I think it's just your choice. I like to have meat taste like meat. Sometimes, like, I crave a bloody piece of meat. And I'm not saying bloody. I'm not saying that it's raw, but it's medium, right? And I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes maybe it's that iron that I'm seeking more of. Maybe it's that cat in me, because he does say I eat like a cat, you know, but I do enjoy raw food. Same with fish. I love raw fish. You put a raw piece of raw fish in front of me, tuna, I love it. You know, um, I grew up eating raw meat as well, like steak tartare. So in my culture, that was normal. Again, it's cultural, right? Um, it has more enzymes. People who are on a raw food diet will eat raw meat, raw chicken. Some just eat raw fruits and vegetables. Others take it to that next step and eat raw food because it has all of the nutrients, enzymes, everything still alive in it. So it depends again on what works for your body. He won't eat, my husband will not eat anything that's pink. I have to make sure I'm cooking it two different ways. I won't eat anything as well. It tastes nothing good to me. So you just, like I said, it's, it's your, what you got to find what works for you. Respect your wife's raw needs and you eat yours well done. <laughs> Okay, you know, maybe as a woman, we need that more. Maybe, I don't know, maybe we have, you know, that iron thing going on when we have, with the menstrual cycle, we got used to it, you know, who knows. But I do, I like mine a little pink. What about uh, goat meat? Uh, goat meat. Goat meat is actually really good for women, especially goat and lamb are excellent choices of animals for uh, women. The way that it reacts with the woman's um, chemistry and for fire, it's a really great way to produce that energy. Um, it's a great alternative too to beef. You know, if you're just eating beef, if you have grown up on only beef and maybe beef, chicken, fish, and that's all you know, I would encourage you to try lamb and goat because what happens if you only eat one type of animal, you are more likely to have health issues related to eating only one type of animal. For example, goat and lamb are very lean. You know, they're leaner. A goat is very lean. You know, so it's a very, um, it's a tougher meat. You have to cook it more. But you eat that in a curry, it's delicious. You know, um, if you go to halal market, uh, halal is just the way that the Muslims prepare the meat with, you know, with prayers and with the way they kill the animal and the way they raise the animal. Similar to like kosher with Judaism, you can find goat and lamb. And that's where I usually go for mine, <coughs> is um, at the halal markets. Because of the way that they raise it, it's a better, uh, better way than most conventional. So experiment with it and see what works in your body. I find, for me, it gives me really good energy. I love lamb. I just can't think of lamb. Like if I start thinking about the poor little lamb, then I can't eat it. You know what I mean? Like, I've got to put myself out of that mode. <coughs> and, um, but I don't eat it often, you know, once in a while. So, everybody good? All right, so we're going to watch the movie now, and I thank you for your... The presentation of this lecture was made possible by donations from listeners like you. Help Gnostic Radio to help others. Make a donation by visiting GnosticRadio.org. For questions and deeper understanding of this lecture, we invite you to explore the wide variety of resources available on our websites. Thank you for your support. May all beings be happy.